everybody, and welcome back to the Moving Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Holtzclaw, and I've been into true crime this week specifically, just like kind of obsessed, so I felt like this movie would be really great to discuss um, this week while I'm kind of in this mindset. So today we are going to be discussing the 2021 film, The Guilty. This is your official spoiler alert warning. I will be spoiling this movie for you. It is actually a remake of the 2018 Danish film by the same name, The Guilty. So I'm just going to give you guys the details and then we are going to hop in because I did a lot of research and I feel very passionately about this topic. So the director is Antoine Fuqua. It's like I said, adapted from The Guilty in 2018, the Danish film that actually received 3.4 million US dollars in box offices. So it did really well. And then I guess Americans were like, hey, let's just see if it'll do well here. Um, the producers are Jake Gyllenhaal, Antoine Fuqua, Michael Litvak, and more. The screenplay is by Nick Pizzolatto and others who helped. Cinematography by Maz Matconi. Edited by Jason Valentin, music by Marcelo Zarvost, and it's distributed by Netflix. It was released in September of 2021. The runtime is 90 minutes, and it stars only a few people. Jake Gyllenhaal as Joe Baylor, Ethan Hawke, Riley Koo, Christina Vidal Mitchell, Eli Gore, Divine Joy Randolph, Paul Dano, and Peter Sarsgaard. So, quick summary... Let me take a sip of my wine. Hold on. I just opened a new bottle and I think it needs to like ferment for a little bit. <laughs> Air out. So brief summary, a troubled police detective is demoted to a 911 operator duty and he scrambles to save a distressed caller during a howering day of revelations and reckonings. Oh, a lot to unpack there, but as you know, Roger Ebert is like my favorite film critic and I found a really good article that he wrote on this film. So I'm going to read his summary. It's long, but I feel like it helps paint a picture here. Um, Joe Baylor is on the night shift in a 911 dispatch center as his city of Los Angeles burns on massive screens in the background. He's an asthmatic who has been forced to use his inhaler even more in the era of smoke and flame. He's also wrestling with an unidentified controversy that demoted this LAPD officer into a dispatcher and has led to calls from reporters. Finally, he's dealing with a separation from his family, trying to call his daughter just to say goodnight. All of this oppressive tension leads him to quickly judge the people who call him, like when he scolds a caller for taking drugs or argues with another who has been robbed by a prostitute on Bunker Hill. So, first of all, I'm just going to say, I don't understand why LA is burning. Like, I don't understand why L.A. is, like, in fire and flames and they don't really explain it. I mean, maybe they, like, I don't know, maybe they wanted to express that the 911 callers, uh, maybe they wanted to express that the 911 operators would have a lot of calls. You know, I don't know, maybe more than like a random normal day, but they don't really discuss it and they don't really talk about like an unusual amount of calls. So I don't know if that was the purpose or not, but, but he also is like fielding calls that have nothing to do with the fire. So I just don't get it. And like, I think they could have conveyed that he was an asthmatic without having like fire and flame and like the city going to shambles. I don't know. Anyway, I thought that was weird. And they didn't really explain it. So, there you go. Um, why did I pick this movie? So, the big reason that I picked this movie gave me mixed emotions. Which means I just had to talk about it. Like, I had such a reaction to it that I decided I had to talk about it on the podcast. So, this big thing is that it's set in one location. This is a tricky thing to pull off in film, and as a screenwriter, I have been told often not to use one location. Um, this is called a chamber film, where, you know, essentially 
the film is in quote unquote a chamber of like four walls or eight walls or like a building that kind of thing there's just there're just so many constraints in having a chamber film one location one set that it can kind of take a toll on the film if it's not done well and and David Boardwell a well-known film theorist and film historian who also wrote like all of my textbooks from uh, college he says that when chamber films are done well finding infinite riches in a little room can make the film successful and limiting story information can be challenging and hard but again done well it can build curiosity suspense and surprise as Borgwell says um, he also says it can create super realism that charges everyday objects with new force and I like this idea that in one location you do get to bring out nuances that you don't really have the time to bring out if you're jumping from set to set or scene to scene or there's you know I mean even if you're just outside shooting there's a lot more that that can go into that and I think when you take the time to be meticulous about bringing certain everyday things to life it can be cool and beautiful and interesting and so for this movie I would say like the most mundane thing that they kind of brought to life was the bathroom and I know that's weird but he like goes to the bathroom to throw up he goes to the bathroom to like go to the bathroom he goes to the bathroom and, like stares at himself in the mirror and it's interesting because if that were in if that were like kind of a, a scene pieced into like an Avengers movie you'd kind of be like all right like come on where's the action you know like that's kind of how I view it is that you get to give power to the mundane and you get to sit in the emotions when you get to take the time to do that, right? So in this film, they have all the time in the world to show him, you know, sitting in the hallway on the phone crying or like in the bathroom or at his desk because there's not much else that they're going to show. And so they can really just kind of bring it to life and add the emotion. And I think Jake Gyllenhaal did really well in this at like, very much creating the emotion in with constraints you know he w he was under a lot of constraints when it comes to his acting here and so was every other character because unless they were like the three other characters that were in the 911 like dispatch office we don't see anyone else we don't see the main characters we don't see this woman we don't see her daughter we don't see her husband we don't see any of it except we just hear them and so it's like voice acting which is you know cool I'll get back to that in a little bit but it's just it's just interesting to me that they did such a good job of only using one location and that's what I mean by having you know this made me have mixed emotions because typically I don't like movies that have a one location like you know when it says set in apart set in an apartment set in a restaurant set in a house it's just kind of it makes me feel like I'm taking a risk watching it because you don't know if it's going to be good or not anyway <clears throat> so according to David Boardwell he I found this article and he really went into the depths of a chamber film and so basically, I mean, obviously plays have been set in kind of like a single room, single set kind of thing. I mean, you can still see that on Broadway. You know, like all of that that goes into a play or a musical on the stage is basically a one set, but it's a swing set or it's a changing set or, you know, whatever. They put the curtains down and then they open and it's, and it's a new set. <laughs> I, I don't think that makes sense, but... But you know what I mean. <laughs> um, anyway, so in film, the major development that kind of brought about these chamber films were Kammerspiel films. And Kammerspiel film is a type of German film that offers an intimate cinematic portrait of lower middle class life. And David Boardwell kind of argues that Danish filmmaker... Carl Dreyer kind of changed this Kammerspiel film and made it into even more of this intimate film kind of as chamber cinema but before truly committing to it in his later film. So he does develop 
more of the chamber film aspect to his own films and that was kind of one of the first times we saw that in film was was through this director Carl Dreyer but originally it came from Kammerspiel film and so it's kind of morphed into and so it's kind of morphed into what it is today through that um the film Two People from 1945 is a pure example of this like chamber film as the I mean the summary is a couple faces marriage problems over the course of a few hours in their apartment so I'm like that, I mean, there you go. You can tell, you can tell it's a one location film, right? In their apartment. And so these films just kind of started exemplifying the power of spatial dynamics between every element that goes into making a film. So, I mean, actors with the camera and actors with each other and actors with the director but then it's also characters with the camera and characters with the other characters and characters with the camera operator and the camera operator with the camera and the, you know, director with the camera and director with the camera operator. Like all of these big relationships came together and were kind of manipulated in a very small setting. And that was something unique and that was something that when achieved well was you know, was very successful. It felt very successful. Um, audiences were very receptive to it. So this is kind of the start of a chamber film. And um, apparently screenwriters call confined space movies bottle plots. And there's a rule to it. So apparently the audience understands that by and large the action won't stray away from a single defined interior. Um, a single location, right? So think the one it's um the friends episode the one where no one's ready where they're just like running around monica's par apartment trying to get ready and um and ross is like freaking out because it's his little like gala or something and no one's ready right like a lot of tv shows started doing this to save production time and money in the middle of a season or like right for a break just so that they could just I guess kind of take a break, you know, make it easier on themselves, but still make it interesting. And it's funny because I was listening to another podcast about this and they said that kind of, like um, networks and, and production companies kind of do the same thing when it comes to um, TV shows having a clip show. So when kind of mid season of, I don't know, I want to say like a few seasons in, in the middle of those seasons, there's like flashbacks and there's a, it's just a whole episode, a bunch of clips of the show. So they're kind of like refreshing your memory if you've, you know, been kind of a long time viewer or they're filling you in if you're a first time viewer. So it kind of like brings in all audiences and it also saves production time and cost and, um, and it's a lot easier to do that, right? Like that's very edit heavy, but they don't have to film much. They already have the footage, right? So it's one of those things that's kind of where it came into TV, but it also just kind of, it typically consists of one room, but it, that's, that's not to say it can't be like one living structure or one work structure. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the living room of the apartment. It can be the entire apartment or it can be the entire house, like upstairs, downstairs. It doesn't just have to be upstairs. It doesn't just have to be downstairs. Um, or in this case is a 911 operator like work building and I don't I don't recall ever like leaving that floor so I remember seeing him seeing um, Jake Gyllenhaal like in the hall in the bathroom in his office in his boss's office but it's all on the same floor you know I don't yeah I don't think he ever leaves or I don't think he ever tries to leave or anything like that so it's like all all of the plot happens within this one floor of, of an office and all of the big interactions happen between Joe and someone on the phone, which makes sense for a 911 operator, right? But it's with his family. It's also with like reporters. It's with, you know, it's not just him answering 911 calls, um, which I think adds a little bit of intrigue. You kind of get to see who he is in his life and what's happened without, I don't know, you just kind of get to hear it like piece 
piece things together as he keeps taking phone calls or making phone calls. It's it's kind of cool and it's unique. Um, Roger Ebert really loved Jake Gyllenhaal's acting. And actually, I think he, he kind of talked about everybody's acting. So he really liked the voice acting of the people on the phone. But he really liked Jake Gyllenhaal's acting. And I have to agree with him, right? Like, I mean, I wasn't blown away by his acting, I don't think. But you could also really get in his head. I think because it was one set, so you're not very distracted. Or maybe I shouldn't say one set. One location. Because it wasn't super distracting. And like I said, it like brought power to the mundane and to the normal stuff that you see every day. And it also allowed for so much emotion to be just seen on his face. You know, like it was just very actor heavy rather than like action heavy if that makes sense like it was just very it was it was more emotional I thought than like than action I don't know I just thought he had to be very expressive but also supernatural in that you know he's not going to be the super animated person all the time just to get you to feel a certain way like he's uh, in a lot of ways, it was the subtle acting that really brought the emotion and brought me into it personally. Um, anyway, so what? what's another interesting kind of like fun fact that I found? Um, you know what? <laughs> I don't even think I really... Did I even tell you like what? No, I didn't tell you like what actually kind of is like the action. So the film really picks up pace and emotion etc when a terrified woman named Emily calls and pretends she's talking to her daughter so she calls 911 he's like hello hello she's like hey sweetie like hey sweetheart whatever and so he's putting it together that the person that is next to her is putting her life in danger but also doesn't know that she's talking to the police so then he starts saying you know like if this person is armed if you know this person say this if you you know, just stay calm if you, um, I don't know, just like yes or no questions, like just to get information, like are you in a car, are you at home, where are, where do you have, like where's your daughter, you know, that kind of thing. So, well, they were all yes or no or like, or he would say, you know, say this specifically if this is true, like if this person is armed, say this. And I've seen a lot of actual real life videos where that's happened, where 911 operators have picked up on the fact that this person called 911 pretending to call someone else, so like their abductor or abuser or whatever, was not gonna, obviously not gonna let them call 911, but was letting them like call their daughter, call their child, call like their boss, call for a pizza, you know, that kind of thing. And the one that I remember is the pizza one where she's pretending to order pizza and this 911 operator's like, um, you've dialed the wrong number. This isn't Papa John's. And she's like, I know, I know. And so then the 911 operator picks up on her being in danger and pretending to call Papa John's or Pizza Hut or whatever so that she could call 911 and have the police come. And it's really smart. And the 911 operator would say things like, ask for more pepperoni if you know this person. Um, ask for like pineapple if he's armed or whatever and in that way they got all the clues that they needed to like dispatch cops and to come help um that's really smart in my opinion um I think I don't know I really like that and I did hear one other kind of a close example where um a flight attendant could tell that a young girl was being sex trafficked or human trafficked. And she, you know, when the the abductor, abuser, whatever, goes to the bathroom, she hands this girl a note that says, like, you know, come find me if you need help or go to the bathroom if you need help or, like, order this if you need help, something like that. And so she did. And they actually got to get the guy off the plane and protect the woman of a girl without like any repercussions. This guy like was not going to be able to find her. And it was just this amazing story of 
you know, people finding out ways to help without putting that person in more danger. Um, and so basically that's what this film is about. And Joe, spoiler alert, wrongfully assumes that this woman is the one in danger and that her like ex-husband or husband has been, has abducted her and left their daughter at home. And he ends up talking to her daughter as well. The daughter calls 911 and, you know, is like, I'm scared. I don't know where my mommy is. My dad took her or something. Like, I don't know where they are. Help, I'm alone. She, this daughter's like six years old. So Joe gets immediately emotional and immediately really pissed off and immediately keeps trying to communicate with this mom and her daughter to make sure that she's safe. He ends up talking with the husband a few times, threatens the husband, is like, you're, like, whatever, cusses him out or says, like, you're a horrible person kind of thing. And this guy is like, you know, you know, I'm hanging up, that kind of stuff. Not dealing with it. And so because Joe is under the impression that the dad, the, the guy is the bad guy, we're under that impression as well. And a lot of the twists and turns that come with this movie is us believing Joe and following his instincts and following what he thinks and what he assumes. Um, it is really upsetting, though, that he's, like, trying to help these people desperately and, like, no one around him is willing to help him. They're like, whatever, let it go. And he just won't. Um, uh, I mean, in my eyes, I'm like, okay, a dedicated cop. Like, that's great. He's actually willing to help people and not brush it off because, you know, she hung up or he hung up or whatever. But... It is kind of ironic because the reason he got demoted was because of his own errors as a cop. And it kind of comes to light that he was impulsive and killed someone. And he assumed and he was emotional. And so he acted with, you know, kind of a lack of judgment. And that's why he got demoted. And that's also why the next day after his, you know, night shift... He's going to court to try to, like, deal with it and and get promoted again, get back to where he was. Um, and a lot of people are saying, you know, like, oh, you'll be back on your feet in no time, blah, blah, blah. But this guy is clearly, like, very emotionally unstable. And, and it's not just because of the situation. He seems emotionally unstable before that, but more in, like, a depressed kind of way but then when he starts getting upset about this woman and you know her potential her possible abduction then he gets really violent really emotional really aggressive and you know disclaimer being emotional and being upset about this kind of subject matter is not I'm not criticizing it and I'm not saying it's bad but he gets kind of violent he's yelling he's cussing he's um, like slamming things, he's like puking, like he's just so uh, unstable emotionally, I think in general, but specifically in this situation. And it was kind of a lot. I remember being like, wow, Jake, <laughs> like not calm, I mean, I guess calm down a little bit, but just, I just, I just got the feeling of like, yep, this is kind of an aggressive guy. And I don't know. Not to say that he would, you know, like, hurt people. Like, I didn't get, like, a violent criminal kind of vibe or, like, a violent, like, abusive cop kind of vibe. I just got, like, a he's super passionate but, like, has no idea how to express himself. And, like, he has – it made me think of, like, a child who's learning how to use his words instead of slap someone because they're upset. It was kind of like that. Like, he had all of these emotions and didn't know where to put them. And I guess – I guess I am saying that's kind of scary for a cop, you know? Like, you should have these emotions, this kind of subject matter and the things that cops deal with all the time, like, should upset you. And sh you should not be as desensitized as I think, you know, most people are about this kind of stuff. But I also don't think that, like, a lack of self-control is a really good trait in a police officer or like a detective like any kind of like law enforcement official don't think that's great but 
I don't know, you as you piece together his background and as you find out more and more information with each phone call that he's on, you can, I mean, you get like a, a big picture of who he is. And I liked that. Um, but it was just interesting to see just kind of like the, just to see this perspective, right? We're seeing everything from his perspective, from his lens. And we're rarely seeing anyone else. And so it really emphasizes him and his emotions and his actions and his thought process. And then I think it really helps us to like, helps the audience put themselves in his position and in his, you know, kind of shoes. But what I did like also was that this was somewhat of a social commentary about police, but not in a social commentary way. So I was, um, you know, reading these articles and Ebert was kind of saying, you know, like the director and the screenwriter, like carefully tie I'm quoting this, carefully tie Joe's behavior into errors in police work without ever making the film into a commentary on defunding the police. And this really got me thinking, yes and no. <laughs> That's not very helpful. Yes, because I do think it's showing all the errors in the police system, specifically in America. But I also think that it's expressing how change needs to happen um so I guess I guess I do agree with this um and I I like that it wasn't a social commentary I like that you could interpret the system however you wanted based on what you were seeing and that's kind of that's like one of my favorite films or types of films types of stories is where you get to have such a say in how you feel and how you think of the situation um, it's not all black and white, and I like that. I also felt like it was very real. There was a lot of realism in this, of emotions, but also just kind of like the police system, you know, and how it works in 911 operators. And there is a little bit of humor in it, specifically in the building, in <laughs> building, specifically in the beginning when he's, you know, like blowing off these people that are calling for no reason or calling to be like, I was just robbed. And he's like, yeah, so. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. You know, I liked it. Um, but anyway, so. Um, so I will say that this film, this 2021 remake, stayed very true to the 2018 film, which was set in Denmark and was in Danish. Um, so the trailer is the only thing I could find with subtitles, English subtitles. But. I mean, it's basically the exact same thing. And, like, you see clips of the main character, the Danish main character basically doing the exact same thing that Jake Gyllenhaal's doing. So I don't think that they're necessarily trying to shit on American police specifically, but I think that they're also just talking about police in general and just kind of, like, the ego that is that is tied into it, the emotions that are tied into it, and just kind of the violence that typically comes with police and crime and... You know, nine. I mean, nine one one. You're calling for an emergency. Like there can be a lot of violence and a lot of um, bad things tied up in what you're calling about in that situation and that event. You know, and I just think it's. I don't know. I think it's interesting, and I also think it's interesting how closely they stayed to the 2018 film. Um, I think they really could have made this a social commentary on on police in America, specifically in 2021 um but I do like that they didn't I like that it was just kind of a a simple like kind of crime thriller drama type I really liked it and it's not that it wasn't interesting or unique it was but I think it was also just something that you can really just like wrap your head around very quickly and get very invested. So you're not confused. You're not like your mind isn't lingering on something that happened before. You're actively piecing things together as you go along just to like add more information. Um, you're not really having to like sort things out as you go. Um, you don't have to like pause and ask questions to the people you're watching it with. Like that kind of thing. And I really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, again... I did enjoy Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. 
Um, and <laughs> this is what Roger said. And I told you he like loved Jake Gyllenhaal's acting in this. So this will kind of explain why. And I think he can explain it better than I can. Um, but you know, I try. He conveys a broken man from the very beginning, finding an emotional undercurrent of salvation in Joe that wasn't fully explored in the original. There's a sense that if he can save Emily, that everything will finally be better. He will be a good cop, a good father, and a good man. And I think that kind of sums up the film. He thinks that this one moment is going to change his life. Um, but I think, I think he also wants to help. And I think that's the beauty of it. He wants to be altruistic. He wants to be helpful. He wants to literally save this woman and her daughter. Um, from who he thinks is is this bad man. And so basically what had happened, and yes, I'm going to spoil this for you, and it's really sad, um, and it brings up a lot of, you know, mental health issues that society has, but also just kind of like what mental health can bring, and, um, or I guess mental health issues. And it also kind of goes back to like the original chamber film idea about like lower middle class poverty and and people in society because what happened was Emily she had seemingly killed her young baby so they had run out of money for her medication for her mental illness and it's bad enough that she thought that her baby was crying because he had what they called snakes in his belly so she like essentially like cut out the snakes in his belly and um, they thought that Emily had killed baby. Um, his name's Oliver. And his, her husband panicked and drove her away. Um, he re just wanted to help her because she didn't know what she had done. She thought she was helping him. She actually wasn't. Um, and so when Joe finally talks to Emily again... She's standing on a tall overpass, threatening to jump, essentially. Contemplating it, thinking about it. Um, and basically, Joe has to, like, talk her down a ledge. Um, but it does get very emotional because that's when we learn that he actually killed someone. and Like, a young teenage boy. And so then he's, like, getting very emotional. It's like, I can't kill you too, Emily. And that's when it gets a little too intertwined. Like this dude needs some help. You know, he needs, he needs lots of therapy. Um, but that's kind of like where everything comes to a head. And then luckily the police are able to, um, get her off the ledge and she doesn't jump. Um, and the baby is actually still alive and in the ICU and the young girl, the six year old daughter is totally fine. Um, and basically he had, the reason that the baby was able to um, live and go to the ICU is because Joe dispatched someone to their house. So he did save the baby and he did save Emily because he sent police to her um, before she jumped. So he basically, like, he did save them. He did save them, but he was very intertwined with saving them. And to me, that was troublesome, you know, like... I guess, like I said, like he was very emotionally invested, very emotionally involved. And clearly it was on a personal level as well, because, you know, he's like, I can't kill you too, Emily. And he's crying. Um, so it's like this big emotional, like, thing for him. Um, and then basically he decides that in the morning when he goes to court that he... Um, basically knows he's going to go to prison because he told his, his fellow officer and friend, like, not to lie for him about what happened with the, um, the 19-year-old boy that he killed. So then you kind of see this resolve of him being like, okay, I need to own up to my, to my mistakes and I need to take responsibility and, you know, like, I have this win with the family, but obviously, like, it, it's, like, taking a toll on him. Um... And so then he, like, talks to this journalist that had been bugging him all night, and that was kind of it. Um, and basically, they call it the guilty because basically he's the guilty one. 
So it's like not the people that are calling. It's not the husband. It's not even the wife. She's mentally ill. Like she, she's not guilty. You know what I mean? So he was the guilty one. He was the guilty. And that is where it ends. And it's really good. And I mean, it's beautifully shot. I would say like in addition to everything else that I've mentioned that I like, I also think that cinematography really, really can help make a chamber film really good, you know? And honestly, I would recommend it. It's on Netflix. Like just go watch it, have a glass of wine, enjoy it, especially for all you true crime girlies like myself. Go watch it. Um, yeah, it was good. And I'm, I'm actually really glad I talked about this. I didn't think I was going to have much to say, but this was a really cool kind of history lesson and film to, to dive into. So, so thank you guys for listening and thank you guys for letting me take a break last week. I took a last minute beach trip that I was really needing. Um, and now I'm tan and sunburn and peeling. So it was a good vacation, a good little getaway. And I am glad I got to jump back into this. So, um, tune in next week and listen to any of the episodes of this season that you have missed wherever you get your podcasts and I will speak to you next week. Bye guys. Now if you run into the fight but you covered with her Diamond rings and all those things bless your life it isn't her Could she love? Could she woo? Could she cry?